Hello and welcome to the recording of my open studio chat about my solitude artwork, which is the artwork I did during lockdown 2020. I forgot to record this when we chatted live, so this is a re-recording coming to you. I will first share my screen. This is a short presentation about the paintings and what I will be doing, sharing with you some of the images. These are all in the exhibition online as well. So if you go to tina-m.com slash open studio, you'll get all the links to the events that happened or are happening and the exhibition links will be live until the end of June but all the artworks are also still on the website. So let's do the snazzy sharing screen. Here we go. So to start off, I thought I would do a little exhibition and presentation as part of my open studios that was all about 2020 and the lockdown artwork, because of course, like many artists, I had to change what I was doing. The little painting you see in front of you, this is a six by four inch postcard size painting on paper, is part of the new series, but also reminiscent of what I was doing. I do a lot of color field work. I'm doing landscapes and geolo geological landscapes, but my focus has always been on really soft color and peacefulness and a, a sense of awe and the sublime, but from the sort of vastness of the space or the aloneness of the space. I had come out of the previous year doing a series called the Fay Run series, which was purely color based. There were no lines in it. And it was based on imaginary locations. <clears throat> so what happened was 2020 hit. And I actually was working on my final year of my master's degree, my thesis year. So I knew 2020 was going to be a little bit lean on the art studio side. I'd still be working, but I didn't have a particular series in mind. I didn't have any exhibition plans in mind. I knew a lot of my time would go to the thesis. And then we locked down. Now I locked down very, fairly early because I have a a persistent cough and was worried about my chest issues. So I locked down in February and I did what I could. I brought paints and things to the studio. I'll just flip to another painting for you to enjoy. Um, and I knew that painting at home, I had a spare desk, which was very fortunate. So working on a table, meant limiting myself to different size. So I bought home a, a drawer full of paints and brushes and I decided to work on paper. I thought paper's easy. I can bring home lots of watercolor paper, cut it to size. And the goal was almost to do a sort of painting a day type um, motivation, but not necessarily one a day. I, I sort of thought, well, if I do a batch a week and a batch like these little ones, you know, I might do anywhere from five to 10 in a week because I'd work on them together, I'd put down under paintings and then put on lines and then keep painting them. So it started in my usual style, in my usual colors. It's real landscapes again. So even though I was locked in the house, I was thinking of my Yorkshire landscapes, the sandstones, the limestones, the dark shales up by Whitby, or I was thinking of the Norway seascapes that I saw in the, the sort of twilight winter. So these turquoises and, and ultramarine blues and I also knew I could have fun. So I started putting some lines in. Now I've always been a bit hesitant with lines in my big canvases. They are there, but they're restrained, they're limited. You can see in this one, for example, I put lines in the snowy hills of Norway. Again, more lines, having a bit of fun with it. I didn't worry about having too many through the, the bit that's meant to be the, the mountain. I thought that would be, it, this is the chance to experiment, basically. We have, I have a whole year where I'm going to be painting at home, doing what I want with sort of no real intentions. I did go a bit mad. <laughs> this is inspired by the shale 
up by Whitby. Now this is a six by six inch piece of paper because I hand tore all this paper as I went. It was the easier way to do it, which meant that sometimes you had odd shapes left and I quite liked the six inch squares, so I kept them. One of the things I liked as I was working on this was I was browsing some Japanese ink paintings um, and some old catalogs from things I saw in Tokyo. And I thought, oh, I'm gonna try and work with some idea of ink. And what I did is I used black acrylic because again, this was real lockdown, couldn't go anywhere, no shops were open, but I had black acrylic ink. So I watered it down to make a kind of thick, inky black. Now really, it made a gray, to be fair, but it was still quite fun. So what you can see in this one, for example, where I've gone a bit mad with lines, is the dark shape, which I think I can annotate. Yes, I can. So the dark shape kind of from this side of the painting, especially this edge here, was actually made by putting down some ink work first. This one again, you've got this left hand side is that inky acrylic gray. But what I also did is I spilled some coffee on the painting. Now I was inspired by Brian Kessinger, who I follow online. He's an illustrator who does wonderful things, works for Disney, but also has his own um, imagery. And he used to do a whole series with tea. Now I don't know if he's doing it anymore. I haven't seen it in a really long time, but I did see some during lockdown and I really liked his tea girls and all of them were made by splashing and spilling tea on the paper first. So I thought I would do this. And so I spilled coffee on pieces of paper and let them dry in my sunny windowsill, which was ridiculous. Um, I learned after the first time that they would blow off and I had to weight them down with rocks, which is fine because I'm a geologist as well. And I have plenty of rocks in the house. Um, and so again, you can see going a bit crazy with the lines, no hesitation here, really enjoyed it. This is a combination of sort of inky grays. Some of the inky grays, I added some gesso to and it became softer grays. I kind of went into this almost monochrome with the coffee and kept some of the splashes. It was hard for me to allow the splashes to stay. I generally don't have edges in my paintings. I, I work with very soft faded color that will lose itself. There might be one sharp edge because I like having one sharp edge. It gives the, the eye somewhere to rest, somewhere to settle. It's a starting point to then move your eyes around the picture. So these were challenging to have so many lines, so many edges of splashes, allowing there to be contours and shapes. But the black wasn't working. So I went and bought online some India ink. Now this was the first, one of the first batch I did with the India ink. You can see it behind the painting. I will use the annotation again to see if this will work. So if you can see, I sort of outline it. Where is my, that's what I want to draw. Um, whoop, that's not working. <laughs> How to annotate. This isn't letting me do it anyway. It's not letting me do it. I don't know how to do it. A stamp, a draw, a draw. Ah, here we go, okay. So if you can see, I'm gonna go just below the edge. You can almost see these inky line shapes. Now, hopefully that'll let you actually see where it's dripped a bit. This here is blank underneath with ink around it. So I'd put on this black ink and it's very, very black. India ink is very strong, um, very solid, very shiny actually. And then I painted over it. And of course, what happened is I got scared and I reverted back to um, the tried and true methods. I didn't put a lot of lines in or if I did, I painted over them really quickly. So there are actually lines going across on this from the sort of the bottom left and straight across. 
but they're pretty much hidden. I put on paint far too thickly and actually covered all of the marks that this lovely India ink made. So I had to let it go. <laughs> um, I had to remember to keep the paper showing. And I did this, here we go. Yeah, it will get there, technology. No, let's get rid of this. Um, so here's one where, again, you can see the indie ink underneath the splashes. And I went over it with really soft layers. So these are very thinned down watercolor with, with water. So, sorry, thinned down acrylic with water. So working as if they were watercolor. This kept the vividness of the tones, I, of the hues I was using. The bottom right hand section is gold paint. So this is actually softly reflective. It's a, it sort of finishes with a matte finish. But I put the lines back in, I left the edges of ink showing. I got brave. I learned that I needed the transparency to stay. We won't go to that one yet. <laughs> um, Contextually, what was happening is that my view of the landscape is beginning to crop in. I'm sort of getting closer and closer to the, the rock or the cliff side, minimizing the, the real horizon or the sea in the image and getting closer and closer. Um, and then what happens, this was partway through the year and July happens. Now, summer's not a good time for me anyway. I was very, very stressed about my thesis and July happened and I hit a bit of a black hole. Um, I have depression, I manage my depression, but in July it overwhelmed me. And all the artwork of which I did very little, I did try to sit and do some, but I didn't do a lot. It went completely black and white. It went entirely black ink and just geology lines. Now this wasn't necessarily because the, the black is the mood, it was because I didn't really have the energy and the focus to put the color on next. So my, my focus wasn't enough to do too many steps. It's really not about it being black and gray, it's about the steps and the effort, the mental effort required to do it. So I did enjoy these, what happened was, there were lots of lines. It became meditative. It was an escape. And I went back to the Norway geology in a lot of these. And when I went, the scaries and the mountains were covered in snow, but you did get lines coming through. Sometimes the rock, sometimes just the coincidental um, patterns that the snow and ice made um, coming down the side of the mountains. And some of them, for this one in particular, um, I, I had some very large quartz veins that I found um, on the side of the mountain in Bergen. And the quartz veins are amazing. They, they're thick. I mean, we're talking thick quartz veins. And so what I did was I thought, well, what if I really crop that view and then just look at the patterns in the quartz with a bit of that you know, dark rock structure that it's within? And so the crystals came into it, the mineralogy. Um, June passed, uh, July passed and the color came back and I knew what I had to do again was, it's, it's as an artist, you always have to remind yourself of what to do. Things come by second nature after a while, but it's really easy to fall into the habits and just do what you know how to do. So it's like, right, need to keep the transparency, need to keep the white of the paper as the light that comes through the color. So back to the color, into ink, then drawing, then some of this lovely soft green on this. But I would go back in and draw again on some of them. So sometimes you you lose the lines a little bit, you want to bring them back. It's a it's very much a back and forth. Then you might want to paint over them a little bit again to soften them back. But lots and lots of lines in this one. Again, from the ideas of the crystals and the Norway geology. 
brought this to Yorkshire a bit. So here in Yorkshire, we have Chalkcliffs. It is the same geology, technically, as the Chalkcliffs in Dover and Dorset. The layers run under um, later rocks and they crop up on all those coastlines. So these are some of the chalk cliffs. Just a little bit south of me is the chalk, Flamborough Head. And I loved this idea. I, I wasn't hesitant at all anymore at the lines. It's just put them in like crazy, really enjoyed it. This is the, the really horizontal layers of limestone going through the cliffs. Norway again, getting in those verticals, letting that really strong India ink play its role. Now, usually in my paintings, I build up from uh, dark to light. So my instinct is to cover that dark. My instinct is, yes, you put that ink down and then you put color over it and brighten it. So it was, it was very, um, the antithesis of what I would usually do with paint by not covering up stuff. Firstly, not covering up the ink and letting the dark show, but also not covering up the white because that was the light instead of painting the light in, letting the light come through from the paper. Some more Yorkshire sea sidey colors, a bit of gold coming in here. Gold is a bit of my go-to color. If something's not working, I'll throw some gold in, see what happens. Oops, I've gone back. <laughs> then I realized it was time to move to the canvas. Now I put all of these on Kickstarter and I made a book of all of the four by six paintings. That book is on my website. It's called Solitude. So you can find it on tina-m.com. Part of making the book and putting it on Kickstarter was I always have a few collectors who I know like to have bigger work. They'll like the four by six paintings, but they tend to also want something larger. Plus at this point, we're sort of coming out of lockdown the first time. And I knew it was time to take what I'd spent about nine months on and start taking these techniques and these new materials to canvases because my work will move to canvas naturally. Uh, this is where a few little barriers were put in the way. Um, first of all, putting India ink on paper is great. Paper is absorbent. Canvas is not absorbent. Canvas for oil painting and acrylic painting, either you gesso or buy it gessoed. I buy mine gessoed. And it is gesso specifically creates a non-permeable barrier so that the canvas it is on does not get rotted by the paint, which means it's not absorbent. So that was quite fun when my India ink would beat up and not spread and not make those lovely soft gray flows as you sort of added water to the edge. Um, the other problem is that pencil works differently on canvas. Pencil, graphite pencil is gray. No matter how dark your pencil is, it is still gray and it is shiny. It is made of graphite, which is a shiny mineral. So once on canvas, A, it's never black and B, it has that shine, which is a bit disconcerting. So I was trying to find new things. I have used watercolor pencil in the past, which works really nicely, but you have to be careful painting over it because it can lift. So I would have to use fixative to put it in. Charcoal is a bit hard because the canvas is so textured, you can't get a really clean, sharp charcoal line. And then I discovered um, Mars Lumograph pencils. I think they're Stedler. Anyway, these actually have carbon in them. So they are graphite, but they have carbon in them and they are black. They come in a range of tones still, so you can get a lighter um, B or 2B or a really dark 8B, just like with regular pencils. And these were perfect. So I had found the solution to my problem. I also found gray and pale gray colored pencils, which helped me make lines over that dark black. So trying to put lines over India ink was another challenge. Um, so with the new pencils, I went and bought absorbent gesso 
which makes canvas a bit like paper. I had to play around with how many layers worked, but I found between one or two layers gave it enough absorbency that the ink worked the way I wanted without disrupting the way I brush with my paint. Because <laughs> if it's too absorbent, then my acrylic doesn't work the right way. And thus I made canvases. So the one you're looking at is 20 inches square or 50 centimeters. Uh, this is another one. And this one I've gone with the verticals of Norway. This is actually inspired by Trollfjord, which is a very vertical cliff. And we went to see it in the snow. So the spotlights from the ship, they were shining at the cliff face, kept, just kept catching the snow and making bright, bright reflections. And the task now going forward, those I consider to be the end of the solitude paintings. So going forward, I'm trying to keep all these materials, all these um, successes, because I feel like I have combined three things I really love, which is the, the soft color tones, the, the um, fine lines of the geology, and the ink work into something that I've always aspired to, and I didn't know how to combine those three. So this, that year gave me a way of having the freedom to really experiment and play with things I probably wouldn't have just done in the studio. I probably would have stuck to needing to be productive, needing to do proper exhibition work. And these are smaller canvases here at the end. These are eight inches square. And these are bringing in all those things, lines, ink, paint on canvas and playing around with real instead of remembered um, geology situations that's again still the same place as Yorkshire and Norway but a third is coming into it and I'll talk about this in my next artist talk which goes with the exhibition of my new work and the new location is Mars. Um, my thesis was about Mars so it was something very much on my mind for the year and also that has carried on with the landing of the Perseverance rover and the images coming back from both that and still from curiosity. So hopefully you've enjoyed that. Hopefully it's given you a bit more insight into the exhibition work. And hopefully we'll go have a look at the exhibition. Uh, it is a virtual exhibition where you can sort of browse the walls and look around. Thank you very much for attending some of you, I think a second time who did ask me where the recording was, um, holding a completely online open studio for June, 2021 has been a technological learning curve, but I've really enjoyed it. Thank you all for bearing with me through Zoom, through virtual software, um, through YouTube. All of this is fairly new to me. And it's been really great having you guys along for the ride. Thanks. Bye.